So, yeah, as Matt said, I'm going to talk about my attempts to see inside HTMs. Um, it's using Compotex Viz that, that Marcus has already helpfully introduced. And I have to say, as an aside, he was very um, misleading in his, his comments there. He actually did a lot of substantial work on Compotex Viz there and the, and the um, integration. And it's fantastic to have Compotex running in on a server on the JVM, which has a lot more capacity than running in the browser. So I'm looking forward to using that as well. Um, so if, if you're interested in Compotex Viz, it's, uh, it's on GitHub. And it has, um, it's able to run HTM in the browser and do some visualizations of it. And well, why, don't, why don't I just <coughs> demonstrate that really quickly. So if I run this, this is a sensory motor uh, data stream. Wait, OK. <laughs> so, so to just get you oriented in this, in this space, on the left, we have a representation of uh, what the input is. In this case, it's just like a sequence of letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, A, J, K, no, H, A, J. And it's uh, currently focusing on one letter, so represented by the black line. So basically, this letter, C, is just the input in a, through a category encoder. Okay? And because this is a sensory motor um, case study, the, it has an additional bit of input, which is the direction that we're going to move in the next time step, the saccade, you might call it. And that's coming from this, this region. Again, it's like a category about the direction and amount of the, the movement. These fields here are the, the activated columns. Um, in, and in this case, there's two layers, layer four and layer three. Layer four receives the um, sensory input on, on the proximal feed forward seg uh, segment. And it also receives the motor input on the, as a distal input to the distal segments. So that's just to get you sort of um, oriented about what all these dots are. Uh, but it's not really what I, what I want to talk about today, because what I, what I worked on for my hack was the temporal pooling algorithm. I was, I've been trying to implement the temporal pooling algorithm. I'm not going to explain it here. If you don't know what the temporal pooling is, you can look it up on the new Mentor wiki, some good stuff. Um, basically, the idea is that to form stable but distinct um, representations in higher level regions or higher level layers. So, um, th and the, it does that by keeping cells active over time while the underlying sequence is um, predictable. So the, the problem I ran into, I've, I've, I've been playing around with implementing this, but as you, as you go through it, the process, you realize that there's a lot of, it's not clear how to do it exactly and, and um, you know, what should, be, what should be the relative weight of all these parameters that, that you're faced with creating. And what I ended up um, realizing I needed was an ability to visualize what is, um, what the different influences are on, this, on the cells that are becoming active. And because it's a sparse representation, it, it, that's feasible. There's only a relatively small number of active cells on each time step. It's usually, the, the number is usually like 2% of the number of columns. So in this example, um, uh, what I'm showing here on the right are the individual bars here are, are single cells that are becoming active. So there's a total of, uh, I'd say, um, 12 or 15 cells that are becoming active. 
And in each one, the color represents the, um, the amount of influence that's causing it to become active. Okay, so red is just the proximal excitation as represented by these, these lines here. It's the proximal excitation that's driving that. The yellow, I don't know if you can see the yellow, that's um, the boosting factor, which is a part of the algorithm um, that's to do with encouraging s columns to become active that hasn't be haven't become active recently. So it, it, it surprised me actually when I saw this how much effect the boosting is having. And I, I'd obviously I'd set that value, but I'd forgotten about it, and it was invisible until now. Um, so this is at the beginning, you know, it's just proximal um, forcing. But if we run this for a little while, just a hundred time steps or so, it will start to be able to predict. Uh, so the, the, the first layer will start to be able to predict um, what's happening. And we can see that in the time series plot. So in this plot, although it's the same kind of structure, it's showing a completely different thing. In this case, it's showing the distribution of the states of the active columns. So red being active and unpredicted, active but not predicted to become active. And purple is correctly predicted to become active. And you can see over time more and more uh, a higher proportion of the columns were predicted, as you'd expect. And we're just, we're just you know, moving constantly around this this one sequence of letters, so of course it's being predicted. Okay, I'm going to stop that there. Also, incidentally, the light blue represents uh, uh, columns which were predicted but did not come, become active. So if we um, look now at what's happening, uh, okay, I'm just going to turn off um, these. Okay. Uh, so you can see on the, on the lower level layer, there's cells which are predicted, uh, but the red, the, the, these represent the active cells, but the red indicates that the, the feed forward input that's activating those was, is not pre is, was not predicted and can't be predicted because it's coming from the input data. So it's not actually not really relevant there. But if you look at the layer three, which is the next layer in the, in the stack, um, the purple here is indicating that what's forcing these cells to become active is input. Hang on, I'll just look at mine. So the, the, the purple lines to these synapses representing that the proximal input that's turning those cells on is coming from cells which were pred predicted below. So it means the underlying sequence is predicted. And in that case, it adds to a persistent level of excitation called the temporal pooling level, which, uh, okay, on this plot is, is the green line. So it's that which is, being, which is responsible for uh, forcing some of these cells to become active in the higher level region. And if we go, just, I'm just stepping forward in time here. Uh, so you have a situation where the, some cell has become, this set of cells has become active. And because it's from the predicted input, then in the following time step, you've got a large amount of persistent excitation, which is the green lines there. And that just decays over time until the, those cells turn off. And if you, you step forward then, You've got red coming in. It, it means some of, something has been unpredicted, not, not predicted in the layer below, and then the temporal pooling tends to turn off in that case. Um, so this has helped me to just um, calibrate or, or check that nothing crazy is going on. And there were just crazy things like the number of uh, active synapses coming in and activating cells was way too low. It was like five synapses. So it's just good to be able to check that, like sanity check, um, and to start to get a feel for what the you know, relative influences of the temporal, continuing temporal pulling activation and um, 
you know, how fast it's dropping off and what's causing it, causing it to drop off. I haven't, you know, I haven't really explored this much, but that's just um, where I got to. So, and hopefully it's given you some idea of, you know, the concepts involved in that algorithm. So, uh, any questions? The predicted um, I line off the chart, right down there. Oh yeah, it's it's, it's sort of cicading forward, and in that case, I just wrap it around. But oh, okay, so it's, it's going to come into A or something. Yeah, I will just step forward. Yeah. So I I'd like to do this better. What what we should have is a is multiple words, and then you're going to have micro cicades within it, and then high level cicades going um, to the next word and so you can start actually, what I was originally hoping to look at was forming a higher level sequence memory, like pr actually predicting the sequence of words on top, like in the next layer. Uh, yeah, but I, get, uh, yeah, I realized that I've got more fundamental issues to do with how the algorithm is implemented before I can start to look at that. So what's the impact of the um, predicted eye line? So your predictions are the letter that is going to be seen oh, next. Oh, this is not but a what prediction. what does that contribute? You, you mean this? this the, the dim line. Yeah, that's not a prediction. That's actually what the, the next movement is going to be. Right. Oh, so I'm sorry. It's not a prediction, but it's, it's the next move. But is that fed in also? Yes. It's, so it's this. There's two, input, uh, two inputs. One is sensory input and one's motor input. So the motor input is only given in as distal um, input. But it's always anticipatory input then. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's and there's different, way, different choices that could be made there as well about whether it comes in proximally or distally. And you know, whether you also have lateral, um, lateral distal connections in layer four, I, I'm not familiar with the current thinking on that actually. Yeah. So I was just curious. <laughs> test, test, test. <laughs> I was, I was curious what. Uh, I see you put this in in JS and JavaScript, right? Well, it's compiled to JS from uh, Clojure. From Clojure. Um, did you have to port the entire algorithm, or did you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's a really nice job. Yeah. Thanks. More questions? Thank you, Felix. Very good. So I, I might just say, um, on the Compotex Viz, on the Viz uh, GitHub page, there's a link to to this, which just has some interactive online demos, different types of examples. Uh, yeah, so check that out. <laughs>